All right, so I am going to go ahead and get us started. Thank you to all of our attendees. We want to welcome you to Case Western Reserve University's Discovering Medicine, Society, and Culture, the Master of Arts in Bioethics and Medical Humanities webinar today. Um, we are excited that you are here and I'll go ahead and get us started. So I am Dr. Leah Jeanette. I'm Assistant Director of Education and Senior Research Associate in the Department of Bioethics. I'm one of the hosts for today. And I'll have Sam introduce herself. Hello, everyone. My name is Sam Hamilton. I am the Assistant Director of Enrollment Management over in the School of Medicine. It's nice to meet everyone. So I'm just going to run through our agenda very quickly. We're going to talk a little bit about Case Western Reserve and the School of Medicine. And then we're going to get into the Master of Arts in Bioethics and Medical Humanities, and specifically our Medicine Society and Culture Concentration. We'll talk a little bit about Cleveland, the application process and deadline, student assistantships, and of course, um, the question and answer portion as well. If you have questions during the presentation, please feel free to submit under the Q&A feature. Um, as we go along. Some we may answer as we go. Most we will save till the end. Um, it's easier that way um, at, at, to save them to the end. I want to introduce our panelists. We have Dr. Eileen Anderson. She is the Director of Education in the Department of Bioethics. She's also an Associate Professor of Bioethics, and she is the Director of Medicine Society and Culture Concentration in our department. Um, Dr. Anderson, do you want to say a little bit more about yourself? I would love to say hello, and I am so excited to be able to be here today to talk about medicine, society, and culture, and the master's degree in bioethics and medical humanities at Case Western Reserve. So, uh, Dr. Anderson, do you want to talk a little bit about the School of Medicine and kind of the work? that Case is doing, Case Western is doing, a little bit. I would love to. So we are so incredibly lucky to be situated within a phenomenal school of medicine. Um, the school, I, I'm going to talk for just a minute about why Case Western Reserve is so extraordinary for the fields of medical humanities, social medicine that are really emphasized in our medicine, society, and culture concentration. The way we are organized, the university has eight different schools, including a comprehensive college of arts and sciences, business school, law school, et cetera. And what is, um, and of course, we're very heavy hitting in the medical fields, nursing is top 10, um, social work, et cetera. Um, what is so exciting about being at Case Western Reserve is that Cleveland is such a medical city. It has, you know, so much innovation and phenomenal clinical care. And of course, our department has close relationships with all four major hospitals in the area that what has kind of happened organically over time is that people who study medical anthropology, medical sociology, health law, medical history, literature and medicine, arts and medicine, have naturally kind of gravitated toward Case Western Reserve. So many of our departments across the entire university are humanistic, social scientific, arts perspectives on health and medical issues. We were just blown away when we took an inventory of expertise on campus. And that is when we brought everyone together to work together to create this uh, concentration in medicine, society, and culture. So the medical school is such a, um, a cutting edge, open-minded setting with rich resources. So that is where we are housed in the Department of Bioethics, within the School of Medicine, within the university, within an incredible community context. 
Um, so that is is kind of our situation at this at the university. So what are these fields um, and why do they matter? I think, you know, never before has it been perhaps more vivid um, to talk about why the kind of non-biological aspects of health and healing matter. We can simply look at what has happened with COVID-19. So many of our big questions, our big controversies, um, were not medical. Obviously, a lot of them are um, dealing with the clinical science of caring for patients, developing vaccines, etc. But so many of the questions that we faced were behavioral. Do I wear a mask? Do I not wear a mask? They were ethical. Who gets access to scarce resources? Um, the questions like, should we mandate vaccines? What happens if somebody wants to reject a vaccine? These, these questions of what should be done in medicine and clinical care, questions of behavioral health, questions of meaning of suffering, of meaning of a mask, meaning of a vaccine, et cetera, meaning of uh, clinical care settings. These questions are so rich and so important for when we're looking at issues related to health and suffering, life and death. Um, we've got a, a photograph of a globe there. When we start to think globally, when we look at issues of social justice um, and look at what kinds of illnesses are killing people around the world, um, taking a step back, you know, looking pre-COVID-19, where let's, let's take looking at child health, where we're looking at over a million children in our world per year dying from something like diarrhea, right? That is not a sophisticated um, clinical situation. We, we know how to prevent diarrhea. We know how to treat diarrhea. It's a very inexpensive to do so. So why are so many children and families suffering and dying still every single year right now in our world? It's because of social inequality, because of political economic factors. So it's, it's these questions that we take a deep dive into through humanistic, social scientific, and artistic um, investigation in medicine, society, and culture. We, throughout the year, throughout the program, we, we look at some of these large, like political, economic, or legal and political um, positions and structures and dynamics that help to shape uh, different kind of epidemiological outcomes around the world. We look at individual perspectives of psychology, psychological anthropology, um, and, and factors about why do humans partake in, and not do things to care for their health. We look at the, the individual meanings. We look at narrative medicine. Um, and what, what are the stories that we tell ourselves and others that help to shape our very experience in the world, including with respect to health and illness? We look at how arts and representation of illness and health interface with our experiences and our culture. Um, and we do things like, it turns out that if you train clinicians and preclinicians in something like art and art history, they learn not only how to see art in the world around them better, but actually see patients and, and, and be able to do better diagnostic um, practice. So it's a very multifaceted set of issues that encompass the non-biological parts of health and healing and um, suffering and hope and, and human behavior.
So like I was talking about, we also have constant technological advances and they lead us to these big questions. Like, should we intervene? When, under what circumstances, for whom? How do we think about critically important questions of justice, respect for people in, in our research and in our clinical practice? And we are always in bioethics and medical humanities looking at what are the values that are being enacted and practiced and, and what should our values be that are informing policy and practice? And you may hear a crackling. I am still in the pandemic. I'm working out of my home today and my cat is um, playing in a box. So I'm going to move her for a second. But um, we have had to adapt to all of these changes as well. All right, let's go ahead and advance. So a question we get a lot is how does studying bioethics and medical humanities help me in my career path? And there, I, I love that this photograph is behind it because there are so many different pathways into bioethics and medical humanities, and then so many different pathways that our alum take after they leave. So Part of the beauty of this field is that it is, as you could tell, <laughs> deeply interdisciplinary and interprofessional um, in how it emerged and in its practice every single day in the world. It, no matter what pieces of you know, the medical humanities, social medicine, bioethics, no matter what pieces, if you're going on to be a clinician, if you're going on to be a researcher, if you're going on to practice health law, if you're going into some kind of ethical regulatory work, if you're going on for a PhD, um, whatever it is, all of those fields benefit when someone has ha learned the foundational ethical principles, behavioral principles, history of the field and how it shapes what we're doing today. Things like this are skills and standpoints and viewpoints and knowledge bases that our alums from the past 25 years come back and say it shaped the rest of their professional life. It is also, this program provides not only classroom knowledge, but our students are out in the field, in hospitals, um, in the community, getting hands-on experience. So most of our students report that it, they, they use the words like launch, it's launched them into their next step of their career. So many of our students go on to clinical fields, MD, nursing, social work, um, all, all kinds of different clinical fields um, and legal professions. And we, we actually do you know, joint degrees as well with clinical and legal and others. We have students who, who get their hands in working in an IRB, get actual experience, go on to regulatory work. A, something very unique about our program at the master's level is a significant proportion of our students get training and actual experience in research. I am actually currently um, publishing with seven or eight of our MA students from last year who were RAs on some of my research projects. And all of our faculty are research active and students are involved in all of these projects if they want to be. So it's pretty extraordinary. All of our students come out with training and knowledge in arts and humanities. Um, and, and go on into those fields as well. And for our students who go on into something like arts, humanities, or social sciences, the fact that they have the clinical experience, the fact that they have been in the hospital, in a community organization, 
um, seeing frontline critical cases helps them in whatever field they're going into. We also have a number of our students who become bioethicists, um, clinical ethicists, ethicists working on policy or research, um, or work in public health and many other academic professions. Um, and along with this last point about discernment, you know, we welcome prospective students to contact us to talk about your own individual path to see how would that fit into the actual program and curriculum, and would this be something that would add value as I take the next steps in my own career. But because there is so much um, exposure and so many different opportunities, uh, students come who can't quite figure out. They know they want to do something health related. They know they want to do something to help people, or um, they think they have an interest in something like research or clinical practice. And they come in and work closely with an advisor to discern what they want to do with the next steps of their life. I had a wonderful conversation with one of these students just this week who came in undecided and already through some of her coursework and beginning clinical rotations, she, she told me, I, I was debating three pathways and now I know which one it is. And it's, it's just a wonderful moment when that light bulb goes off. So we are actually one of the oldest programs in the country, celebrating 26 years of phenomenal alumni. Um, and if you do the intensive program full time, it is two semesters, so you can complete it in one year. Most students who choose to do that will complete it in nine months. Um, other students who want other kinds of experiences or maybe are um, simultaneously working or doing something else um, may also extend it into a 12-month program. Um, and, and we work with you to figure out what's the best sequencing for you. So each student, as I mentioned, works with an advisor and with myself and Dr. Jeanette to make sure that they are, they are setting up their curriculum and getting what they need for their particular pathway. We have um, 13 and a half of the 30 credits are electives to customize your curriculum. So in medicine, society, and culture, most of our students will take courses in medical humanities, medical social sciences, arts and medicine, maybe take an international course that, that really hits home cultural differences, something like this. But the, that is up to you in addition to our required courses and experiences. Each student gets 160 hours of clinical ethics rotations, 80 per semester. This is a highlight of our program for most students. We have partnerships with our two uh, private and two public hospitals and students are precepted every week on what they are observing moving through a huge array of um, subspecialties. We also have a number of short-term study abroad elective courses. We're really excited that um, hopefully coming out of the pandemic, those courses are all going to be up and running again. We are certainly planning them for next year. We do have our two concentrations. We have a traditional program where your electives um, can be used in you know, whatever way you and your advisor determine. When you do a concentration in medicine, society, and culture, there are a couple additional required courses and experiences. We also have a concentration in research ethics, which again gives students this, this hands-on experience in an institutional review board, at the university, in a hospital, um, and does have a couple additional requirements as well, very analogous to the medicine, society, and culture concentration. 
We have, again, very unusual in a master's program, competitive student assistantships that um, applicants can apply for. And those generally, the earlier you apply for those, the better because they are competitive. And this is where students might have the opportunity to serve as a research assistant or a teaching assistant or a program assistant, and that helps offset tuition. We also have a number of dual degree programs around the university from MD to PhD, um, to other master's dual degree programs and law dual degree programs if people are interested. So the required courses for the Medicine, Society, and Culture concentration include this foundational class um, that the associate director of what we call MSC and I co-teach. He is a world-renowned medical historian and we teach in the fall a Foundations of Medicine, Society, and Culture um, class, which is really the core readings, but all the way up through contemporary readings and the, the core concepts that um, you need to really have an expertise in medical humanities and social medicine. We also have a really exciting, um, it's like a half credit course, a 1.5 credit in medicine, society, and culture seminar where our students um, get to customize attending a series of different events around the university, around our cultural institutions, abutting the university, hospitals, or even Zooming all over the world to have different experiences in humanities, social sciences, and arts related to medicine, health, and healing um, to, to expose them to a, a wide breadth of approaches and topics. And then you would work with your advisor to round out your electives to best suit your interests and needs. Um, again, all of our students in the fall attend clinical rotations. In the spring, some of our medicine, society, and culture concentrators will do a different kind of practicum. So for example, in recent years, students who know they want to go on and pursue a PhD in something like sociology or anthropology, they might be embedded in a very relevant research um, experience. So they are getting research skills training, and they might come out with the publication as a product of their practicum. Um, we have also had students, rather than rotate into one of our um, hospitals, maybe they were really interested in questions of social justice and medicine and interned at a, a free clinic. Or we had a student go into the Department of Public Health right in downtown Cleveland. So there are other opportunities um, depending on your particular pathway and interests and you would work with your advisor and uh, with myself to set that up. We also have a monthly reading group in this area that draws people from across the university and actually the wider community as well. Dr. Anderson, I want to ask you a question about this. So why would a student choose to do this particular concentration? What do you hear from our students in making this choice? That's a wonderful question. We have, um, and, and I will say the last uh, several years, about half of the students in the MA program want to do this deep dive into medicine, society, and culture. Um, they tend to be students who, you know, come from a few different angles. Maybe they have some kind of arts or humanities or social science background when they were undergrads, and they are still passionate about that. And they want to continue to engage that and grow their expertise in their master's level coursework. 
um, some of our students maybe have had experiences like international experiences or are immigrants themselves. And so they know firsthand how important questions of cultural context or understanding um, societal dynamics are to both population level and individual health outcomes. Um, I would say actually in both of our concentrations, um, there is a social justice emphasis, but that's another reason why people come to medicine, society, and culture to get analytic tools to take with them maybe into their clinical practice or into their, their future policy work or whatever it is. Um, so on the other hand, I was just talking to two of our amazing students this year um, after our foundational core course, who, who had absolutely no background in humanities and social sciences. They had very hard science kind of technical backgrounds, but their life observations and experiences led them to want to get this kind of education as they move forward, both of these into clinical professions. And the way we run this concentration is that we do not expect that anyone is bringing any particular kind of background to the table. We make sure to cover the basics all the way around. That said, we always do have students, you know, maybe who were medical anthropology majors or medical history who are bringing a tremendous amount of knowledge with them. And we love that because our students learn so much from each other. Um, but also none of us, not even any faculty member is an expert in every single field, which is why we bring in, you know, a powerhouse interdisciplinary faculty to help teach all, everything as well. So people come to it for a variety of reasons, um, born from their academic programming or their personal experiences. Um, and, and all of them really think it will give them tools to be better professionals going forward. I think that's really helpful to understand the, the variety of reasons that students may choose to do um, either this concentration or even the research ethics concentration yeah. in our program. And sometimes as you go through the process of admission, just in your interview with one of our um, amazing faculty or staff, you know, the, the person doing the interview, you know, may say, hey, it sounds like you really have these interests. You might want to look at this concentration where you get a certificate um, at the end of the program. And that's something that students are really proud to put on their CV or their resume. Yeah. So I'm going to transition us to talk a little bit specifically about two of our things that we highlighted in our uh, master's program. One is our clinical ethics rotations. Um, so um, I'm happy to talk about this. Um, specifically, I'm the course director for our clinical ethics rotations in our master's program. Um, we touched on this just a little bit. Um, so our clinical ethics rotations are 160 hours, um, 80 and 80 per semester um, at, um, as you can see here, either Cleveland Clinic, Metro Health Medical System, um, VA or University Hospitals. These are four major teaching hospitals here in Cleveland. Um, we have basically three different types of settings um, within the hospital. So we have rounds that students can go on, their general floors, ICU units, they can be medical, pediatric, neonatal, burn, trauma, cardiac, surgical, and that's not even the full list. Um, there's step-down units. There's a whole host of different types of health professionals that are on these different rounds. We have committee meetings that students can attend, which is phenomenal. Um, and then there's one-on-one -on -one opportunities with healthcare professionals in all different types of settings as well. I would say these are unprecedented opportunities for some of our students. You know, the ways that students can get access to the hospital systems 
I don't know that any one student would be able to set up this type of rotation opportunities on their own. Um, and so we're very proud of these. These have been a part of the master's program from the beginning, and we are very privileged to be able to offer these. So um, students will be at one private hospital, so either Cleveland Clinic or University Hospital, and then one um, public hospital, either Metro Health or the VA. And what's great is, as was mentioned before, you're reading at, meeting on a weekly basis with a preceptor um, who knows these hospital systems really well. They either are a clinical ethicist there or sit on the ethics committee. And they are able to talk about um, the culture of the hospital, the ethical issues that our students have observed and really talk about the nuances of what students are observing and seeing during their time at the hospitals. Thank you so much. Yeah, it really, um, that experience is just unparalleled. And we are so incredibly fortunate to have these dynamic short-term study abroad electives. So students can spend one or two weeks, depending on the course, um, with national and international bioethics um, and, and faculty from both Case Western Reserve and from the hosting site um, with a bioethics and medical humanities focus and talk about learning about <laughs> culture. You know, it's just extraordinary. So Dr. Jeanette, can you tell us about the different courses that we have represented here? Absolutely. So we have a course um, to Costa Rica um, that normally travels, travels during winter break. Um, this year, we're unable to offer it due to the pandemic. Um, we're already <laughs> starting to plan it for next winter break, so 2022 to 2023, which seems like so far in the future, but it will be here before we know it. Um, it focuses on health and healthcare um, perspectives and rural versus urban settings. Uh, we have a course to Granada, Spain. Um, that travels in May that focuses on health and wellness through the perspective of movies. Um, we have a course to Paris, France that focuses on health and the influence of culture and religion that goes uh, spring break. We have actually two courses to the Netherlands. One is spring break, one is in May. Um, spring break, we're looking at a course that focuses on death and dying. And then in May, it's a course that focuses on women's health and public health. And then the U.S. National Parks course um, is a course that focuses on human health and environmental ethics. Um, when that course initially launched, it was focused on um, the bison, and that was in Yellowstone National Park, uh, which is a fascinating um, a case example of human health and environmental ethics. Um, I've even just sitting in one class on that was entirely fascinating. Dr. Anderson led that along with the other faculty in our department. Um, we've looked at ways that that course can also be replicated at other national parks um, across the country. And so um, what's neat about that course is, you know, it can be done at different national parks. Um, and so that can that could change year to year on what park system we go to. And hot off the press, during the <laughs> pandemic, we actually, um, we are so lucky here in Cleveland to have Cuyahoga Valley National Park and a set of metro parks that literally were just named best in the United States. So we worked with them and with uh, the local communities and governments and farms to create a, a local version of this course too that is actually um, focused around food justice and looking at um, some of the, the farming and food practices right in our own community. So I think what's really great about these courses is they are a way to do an intensive course. So they are, as you can see, there are three credit hour elective but it is done in a compressed time frame, So you're still getting three credits, um, but it's done in a week or two weeks. Um, and you're able to get a course in towards your master's degree at the same time. So and they are, love them. We, we yeah. have our star alumni come back, you know, and 
talk about how like this one intensive week changed their life. It's, it's really, they're just such exciting um, opportunities. Absolutely. So just a quick mention of our dual degree programs. We're not going to spend a lot of time on this, but the key here is that we have a lot of different options. If you are specifically interested in a dual degree program, we'd love to hear from you to talk more about this. The main takeaway is you must apply and gain acceptance to each program independent of each other. So there's, uh, you know, different application process for the MD um, program, JD program, and so on and so forth. So please reach out to us. We'd be happy to talk to you about these. Um, they really create unique learning opportunities for students, and they may be the right fit for you, but they can also be quite challenging. So we'd love to talk to you um, more about these um, in a separate conversation. Um, so a little bit about Cleveland, um, Dr. Anderson Fide, do you want to take this? Oh my gosh. So, you know, I absolutely love Cleveland. <laughs> um, I love living here. It's just an extraordinary city because it has all of the, like opportunities of a, of a big city, you know, and I've lived on both coasts and, and all over. Um, we have, you know, the, the second largest theater district in the United States after New York City, you know, top notch shows coming through. The Cleveland Orchestra, one of the best in the world, Cleveland Museum of Art, you know, one of the best couple in the entire United States and, and many other museums. And actually, I was down at the House of Blues last night um, for a concert. Like there's tons of um, live music in the area. We've got big sports, if you like sports, um, phenomenal food, top-notch food you see represented there on East 4th Street, which is exactly where I was last night. Um, and Little Italy is a community within walking distance. It abuts uh, the medical school with phenomenal food and cultural events. But we've got lots of different kinds of um, communities and and you know, if you like to eat, you can have everything from, you know, phenomenal different ethnic foods to absolute top-notch world-class cuisine. Um, and again, our beloved sports teams, one of which just changed names, now our Cleveland Guardians, Cavaliers, um, you know, everyone's, you know, going to the Browns games right now. So, so we've got all this big stuff, right? And as I mentioned, a national park, a phenomenal set of metro parks, a lot of green space. We're on a gorgeous lake. A lot of our students like to get down on the waterfront. Um, great nightlife. But what's different is that it's really accessible. You're not gonna sit in traffic forever. Things are affordable. And many of these things are offered to students at either free or very reduced rates. So you can have an absolutely world-class cultural or arts experience, like free or $10 or like, it's just incredible. Um, we've got decent public transportation, uh, you know, but a lot of our students will bring cars also. So, you know, on the weekends, like I know students this weekend are carpooling and going out and going apple picking. We've got these gorgeous, you know, rural areas, pretty, um, you know, pretty accessible also. So the lifestyle in Cleveland, for whatever reason, Cleveland, you know, has taken some hits in reputation nationally and internationally. But when people actually live here, it is such a rich and wonderful life. So our students, you know, most of whom are coming from somewhere else are always really pleasantly surprised by the quality of life that they can have when they're not in the classroom. And we do encourage our students, you know, to really get to know their, their home for the year and to, to go out and do some, you know, have a life in addition to, you know, the intensive um, program. Yeah, I always make the joke that Cleveland just needs better PR. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> no, no one knows what's here. <laughs> and how great it is. <laughs> yes, and people fall in love with it, like me, for sure. Absolutely. 
So um, just real quick, our application requirements. So um, we require transcripts from all undergrad and grad programs. Um, we look for a statement of purpose. What we're looking for is your interest in bioethics and medical humanities and how it's going to fit in your career path. That could include you're trying to figure it out. You know, we, as we indicated earlier, you know, this program is also for students who are still discerning and are, are trying to figure out their next steps. And so that can be included in your statement of purpose as well. We're looking for a CV or resume, and then two letters of recommendation, including one from a faculty or professor. Once we have your completed application, including those letters of recommendation, it's gonna be, um, once we have that completed um, package, it's gonna be reviewed and then um, by someone on our admissions committee, and then we'll interview you as well. And that time frame um, can be done typically within two to three weeks, we can render a decision. So it's a pretty quick turnaround once we have a completed application. Uh, so one of the amazing things that we offer and not many master's programs do um, is what we call student assistantships. Um, Dr. Anderson, I'll let you talk about this. These are amazing opportunities for students. Yeah, so this is what I mentioned before where students get, um, you know, it is, it is competitive. Um, we can't offer this to every student, but, but you're awarded partial tuition waivers um, based on, you know, need and merit. Um, and that is, you know, what, what happens in return is not just students have to grind something out, but rather students get these incredible professional development opportunities and are learning how to do research. Like I mentioned before, maybe are publishing with faculty, which many of us do. Or I love um, working with our master students who are who want to be teaching assistants, and I bring them with me into teaching um, some of our foundational undergraduate courses, and they get experience learning how to teach, um, working with students, etc. So you know, another really exciting opportunity. Um, and sometimes they're doing administrative activities with faculty and staff, things that the program needs, um, doing some research because we're always innovating and growing programs. So to the best of our ability, if you're awarded an assistantship, we try to match um, your kind of interests and career path with whatever opportunities we happen to have that particular year. So you have to have your master's program application submitted and then you can submit the assistantship application. So our application for this opens in January and I would definitely urge people um, because there are a finite number of assistantships um, to apply on the early side if you would like to be considered for one of them. So in terms of um, deadlines, um, so we currently have our application open. Um, our first priority deadline is December 1st. What this means is if you submit a completed application by December 1st, we can render a decision um, by the end of the year. Um, for students who are currently in undergrad, students who are currently enrolled at CASE, um, we have a program called Integrated Graduate Studies. Their deadline is March 1st. If you are an IGS student or interested in the IGS program, email us. We could talk more about that. Priority two deadline is May 15th. Um, if you are interested in applying for the student assistantships, that deadline is June 1 to get your student assistantship application in. Our final deadline for the master's program is August 1st, and then August 22 is when orientation and classes begin. Um, so I want to, you know, move to our question and answer time um, for our last 15 minutes or so. Um, I see we have a question in here. I'm going to go ahead and read it. Um, so we have a student who lives, it looks like in the Baltimore area, currently working full-time, but interested in the program, especially the MSc concentration. 
What kind of flexibility is offered for out-of-state students? That is a great question. And, you know, prior to the pandemic, we were in-person 100% only. Last year, with the pandemic and things being remote, we actually did have students who were all over the country and even internationally when everything had to be converted to remote. Um, and we, we were surprised actually at how many co co components went really well with um, some asynchronous programming, with Zoom rooms, with you know, some of what we learned through having to pivot during a pandemic. This year, we are fully back on campus. Um, so we do require our master's students um, to be in residence. Um, the things like clinical rotations, while we certainly came up with um, very meaningful and rewarding online versions, there is, is nothing like being you know, on the ground in the hospital, for example. So right now we are not offering um, a remote option. I would urge you, you know, if you want to talk through your individual situation and see if there would be ways to creatively brainstorm, um, you know, what, what could be possible, you can feel free to email me and I'm happy to set up a phone call to do that. Another way to begin to engage the program, if we can, you know, think creatively about the pieces of it that you have to do in person, is that some of our courses, for a couple different, different reasons, are being taught online completely. So it might be possible to enroll part-time and begin, um, you know, taking those classes that are um, online only to start getting credits, um, which might reduce your time in person on campus. But we can, we can think about your situation specifically. We do not currently offer a remote master's program. Are there other questions, Dr. Jeanette? Or anyone, feel free to type in any questions that you have. So, you know, one of the questions we get a lot um, is, you know, what are some of the topics that we see for capstones? Because you talked a little bit about um, capstone just briefly, um, kind of in passing um, earlier. So capstone, just kind of that, to give a, a highlight. That's a great question. Yep. So each student in the spring semester will do a capstone paper, usually. Sometimes with Medicine, Society, and Culture, it turns into more of a project. And this is where you get to dive deep into a topic you are passionate about, and you will become an expert on that topic. So actually, some of our students have published papers out of their capstones. Um, but we see a wide array of capstone projects. So, so students who work with me are generally working in like medical humanities, social medicine. They may be doing something about cross-cultural um, practices of medicine or healing um, or arts and medicine. Um, we have students working with other faculty who are looking maybe at um, stem cell ethics or some cutting edge technologies. Actually, I have one student this year who's gonna end up working with me on a project having to do with artificial intelligence um, and in the medical field and ethics. Um, we have students who are interested in reproductive ethics or research ethics. Um, gosh, we've had some phenomenal ones recently you know, along with some of what you were saying in environmental ethics and human health um, or in uh, maternal health care, um, in social justice issues. So you, you've seen a lot of these also, Dr. Jeanette, feel free to 
Yeah, kind of there was up, but a, a wide array. Yeah, and, I yeah. There's one last year that I helped oversee. Or I was a reader for. Um, she was looking at um, patients with um, issues regarding capacity and being sent to nursing homes and the complexity of ethical and legal issues. There was a capstone last year about LGBTQ care and specifically transgendered yep. patients. Yep. Um, such a variety. Such a variety. It's, it's kind of like, you know, some of our students come in because they know they're passionate about one field or another. And so that's the kind of thing you can, you can really cultivate and turn into, you know, a dynamo capstone. Other students are coming in for that discernment and they spend the fall getting exposed to all of the major issues in bioethics and medical humanities. And along the way, we urge people to pay attention to what really excites them, what really makes them think differently, what really moves the way they see the world. And, and maybe pick up one of those topics to really dive into in the spring. Yeah, I'm thinking of, I was just talking to one of our students who went on to a PhD who, who did her capstone in psychedelic medicine, and now she's doing an entire doctorate on that that was launched yes. from her capstone work and her capstone research. Um, we have students who do public health ethics, um, both you know, domestically and, and also around the country and around the world. Um, so, you know, one way to get a sense of the variety is to look at the faculty list on the website and see kind of um, the variety. Oh, I had somebody do a, a phenomenal capstone last year that is actually one of the ones I mentioned that's being published or a paper out of it is we're co-publishing on um, the child health in the legal system with the guardian ad litem system um, in the county in which the university is in. Um, so there, you know, and, and lifespan issues are really important to all of bioethics and medical humanities. And we cover those in the program. So some people are really interested in conception and birth. Some may be interested in, in child health. We have, as you actually teach a course, Dr. Jeanette on adolescent health. We have a lot of interest in that area. And we have a variety of adulthood, aging, and death and dying issues. So we really cover the entire lifespan as well. And students will engage capstones all along that spectrum. So that's, yeah, the amazing thing I think every year is to see the wide variety of, mm -hmm. of topics that students choose. And one of my favorite days is we do like flash um, presentations. So students are like blown away hearing what each other did um, in, you know, just a brief few minutes. And, so, and students bring their, their friends and their families. And, you know, we, we see the power, you know, of what we did collectively. And that's why, you know, one of the special aspects of this program, and I would say of concentrations also, is the community created. We have our cohorts of students, you know, it is an intensive program and you're having these really unusual experiences where, you know, maybe you're engaging something that you've, you've never done before, like seeing a birth or a death, or, you know, we have students who will rotate in our county jail or have experiences that they haven't necessarily had before. Our students tend to bond together and have an identity as bioethics and medical humanities students or as research ethics concentrators, medicine, society, and culture concentrators. And it, it is amazing the kind of both the networks that have formed, um, you know, over a life time now with 26 years of data, um, you, you join this amazing alumni family and, and have people that you can reach out to when you hit different moments in your career where maybe you want some mentoring or networking. Um, and, and people build lifelong friendships um, as well as learning from each other and really engaging each other professionally. Um, and of course, 
Dr. Jeanette, I bet you can read my mind right now because I'm smiling. One of our alum who is actually now research staff in our own department, um, ended up meeting her significant other in the program, which we sometimes joke about. There's no guarantees. Um, but, but just the sense of identity and community and network and the fact that you are entering, you know, the, the Department of Bioethics family through this program um, where you become part of you know, a, a dynamo, I think we're at something like 800 alum, you know, network who are out there making the world a better place, being phenomenal professionals across a wide array of fields who will almost always open their doors and their emails and their phones um, to receive current students or recent alum to help them along their way. Absolutely. So, um, I'll just put out one last call if there's any final questions for us. Dr. Jeanette and um, Sam, thank you so much for hosting us today. And I want to thank everybody who came um, and hung in there or participated in the webinar. And, um, you know, we're available. If you are wondering if this program is for you, if you are ready to apply, um, you know, we, we're here. Shoot us an email and that'll get the ball rolling. And we'd love to talk with you, learn who you are, and um, see if this might be a great fit for you. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you.